All right. Hmm. Okay. I believe. Let me move me over a bit. I believe we are ready to go here. How's everybody doing? What's up, Game Boy? I agree. We got some exciting news to talk about. Exciting indeed. Um. Okay, I've got that open. I've got that open. Don't think there's anything else I need. So yeah, I'll just wait a couple minutes here for people to show up. Yada yada, etc, etc. Some background music while we wait. What's up, Dave? Howdy, howdy. Yeah, Red Claw, I couldn't agree more. The fusion reactor in particular is just awesome. I don't think we saw anything new in this one, did we? There's probably spoilers in these screenshots somewhere. That's one thing I haven't been doing is like religiously hunting down little baby spoilers and screenshots and stuff, but there's probably something in here. I mean, they're using a whole belt reader, you can see. So that's cool. Probably some new items in here. I guess I don't see, are those engines? Those look like engines. This is all stuff we already know. There's one of the display doodads with nothing on it. The Tesla turret's really cool too, I'm not gonna lie. It doesn't, it feels slightly off to me. What it really reminds me of actually for what should be fairly obvious reasons, is the, um, uh, what's it called? The Doomsday Machine from Total Annihilation. Is it called Doomsday Machine? Yeah, that's the one. It, uh, See if I can find a picture of it. You'd think it'd be easier to find given how many people love this game. Um, but yeah, it's it's this one. Oh, I didn't want a video, but here we go. Here's a video. Um, no, that's not it. Is it? I guess it is. It's like, but it's like a pop-up tower, and it's got a little sphere on top, and it shoots lasers. Um. So that's what made me think of that. But it's like the little round thing on top that shoots, you know, is what triggered my memories of that. The Red Alert Tesla Tower is pretty different. That's like a Christmas tree with a ball on top, you know? So that, that one feels significantly different to me, especially because this one pretty clearly shoots a beam and the Tesla Tower shoots a lightning bolt. And while this beam has little lightning elements to it, it's far more of like a, a laser beam or a particle beam, they call it, than it is a lightning bolt. It's like a, a particle beam that creates chain lightning on a hit. But the straight line nature to the beam, I think, makes it feel far more like a laser than a lightning gun, even though it is a lightning gun. It's kind of weird. Uh, hey, Demon. Hey, Complex. How you guys doing? <laughs> We are gonna jump in here. Just a moment. Yeah, Blue Squid, it's all just electrons, right? I mean, technically everything is just 
some mixture of electrons, protons, and neutrons, right? You know? What's up, Waskly? Oh, you know what I don't have open is the Twitch manager. Where's that? I need that. Over here. And don't worry, Dave, I did get the reference. I think. What about quarks? I don't know anything about quarks. Not gonna lie. I am quarkless. Okay, I'm gonna get started. I think I'm, oh, I need to turn off the music. That's right, there we go. Now I'm ready. Now I'm ready. Hello everyone, and welcome to The Factory Must Grow, episode 16. Another solo episode, but we will have some more guests soon as the summer is wrapping up and fall is coming quick. We're getting back into the regular swing of things here. And today on the cast, we'll start with another mod spotlight as usual, and we will discuss three Factorio Friday facts. So we've got plenty of content to chew on today, which is pretty exciting. And then there's another bit of news I have to share with you. But before we dive into the show, as always, I want to thank the show's patrons and supporters. All patrons get a special Discord color, and I've also changed it around so that birthday month shoutouts are on all tiers. So as low as two bucks a month, you can get a birthday month shoutout, as well as getting a special color in the Discord to, uh, you know, just support you for your support. So as always, if you'd like to support me, head over to patreon.com slash crydax. So moving on to the um, mod spotlight, there is a new one I want to talk about. It's very, very fresh. It's called Grid Torio, and it was made by Sover9000, and it was only uploaded to the mod portal 15 days ago, and it's already got over a thousand downloads. And I'm just going to read the description for you, and then we'll talk a little bit more about it. But it says, you start in a single chunk with iron, coal, stone, and a market. You must sell some basic items for coins and then use those coins to expand to other chunks. Automate trading with markets, capture ruins of enemy bases, and discover how the world changes as you venture far out. So what's really cool about this mod is it actually locks you into like one square um, when you start out. And... I'm going to pull it up for the people watching the VOD right now. So it locks you into kind of one square. So it's called Grid Torio because it's a grid of squares and you only are in one of them. And it's kind of almost like uh, City Skylines where you're like purchasing plots of land nearby with coins. And so you sell items that I guess you make. I don't know exactly how it works. I haven't even watched gameplay of it, but it looks like a really cool concept. So... If it, uh, if it sounds interesting to you to kind of start in one spot and you've got some resources and you can mine them and make some things and sell them to the market and then purchase more plots of land and then in those plots of land there's new things, right? There might be enemies in one plot of land or there might be uh, uranium that you hadn't had before or there might be, um, it sounds like there are some, some ruins so you know you might have some uh, items that you can grab. And I'm assuming that the plots of land get more expensive as you go further out but there's more resources in them and such. Those are assumptions I don't know for sure. There's not a ton of description on the mod page, uh, not gonna lie. So it sounds pretty sweet. It is definitely something I'm interested in checking out. I'm Right now, I'm still kind of in that spot where I'm not sure if I want to play Factorio right now because I want to save myself for Space Age and it's only two months away. But uh, there's a part of me that's kind of like, maybe I should play a little mod like this just to try it out. But we'll see. I don't know if I'll try it out or not. But you definitely should go try it out. So yeah, that's our mod spotlight. It's uh, an exciting new one. And I, I'd like to hear if any of you go try it out. Let me know what you think on the Discord. So we're going to move on to FFF 420. And there are three of them today, 420, 421, and 422. And they're all very exciting. It, like... 
three bangers in a row so we've got a lot to talk about here 420 is about fusion reactors and as you know there are already nuclear reactors in factorio and they figured you know what that's not good enough that's not enough power for the late game especially with all of the you know larger bases and bigger modules that make things cost even more power you just need a lot of power so they they figured we needed we need a solution to this and they they settled on fusion which i think is interesting because it's kind of the same you know as a nuclear reactor conceptually so you know and i know you guys can't see who are listening on the podcast so i'll try to describe it but it kind of looks like a a particle accelerator donut ring kind of thing with like a little spire in the middle it the overall vibe of the look is reminiscent of the beacons to me um it kind of has that industrial but high tech at the same time look which I do think they continue to nail. Like the art direction in Factorio is incredibly consistent and they really do a good job of that gritty technology look rather than a smooth, you know, sci-fi look. And I think that's really cool. And so, yeah, let's actually get into what it does. So we already know about nuclear reactors having neighbor bonuses. And because you actually need to be able to feed uh the fuel cells into them and extract the fuel cells out the most neighbor bonus you can get is three because one of the faces needs to be accessible now if you've played with bob's adjustable inserters you know that that can uh change and you can get a diagonal inserter but at least in normal factorio the most you can get is three neighbors but the fusion reactor is a larger entity it's uh it looks like it's six by six and what you can do is the the neighbor connections are actually offset from the middle of each side so it's a little hard to explain without seeing it but there's essentially two neighbor connections on each side for a total of eight now you wouldn't be able to fit eight because the ones on the corners would overlap with each other but there are eight connections on each fusion reactor and as long as you're connecting and yeah, so if you imagine, I'll try to describe it. So if you imagine the fusion reactor, it's a six by six. So imagine the north face of it or the top face of it and the middle of that. And to the left a little bit, there's a connection. And to the right a little bit, there's a connection. So there's two connections on that top face. And you could put two reactors that are side by side, kind of centered where the you know in between the two reactors is the center of the main reactor and those would all be connected and so that's how you can get neighbor bonuses going so you can have three reactors each with a neighbor bonus of two right so that's pretty cool you can't do that with nuclear reactors because of the grid like nature so these are almost more of a they're not hexagons but they kind of end up looking a bit hexagony in nature with how you angle them because you kind of end up lining them up diagonally to get the neighbor bonuses you know you go a little bit to the right and a little bit up to get the neighbor bonus anyway all that to say you can pretty easily get larger neighbor bonuses they show an example of one that has a neighbor bonus of six and let's see what it, uh, where's the power yeah you get a hundred megawatts at the core whereas nuclear is only 40 oh shoot i didn't write that down i think i'm remembering that right and obviously with the higher neighbor bonuses you already have two and a half times more power from each of these and then the neighbor bonuses make that higher and the big deal is how do you actually turn that power well i should say turn that energy into power because like nuclear reactors it's not just making power itself it creates a superheated plasma and so you feed it with this coolant and then it creates a superheated plasma and hot coolant and so you do have to recool the coolant and then you feed it with its you know fusion fuel cells uh whatever those are called they call them power cells in the fff i'm not sure if that's a placeholder name or if that's the final name that feels a bit boring if that's the final name i would have assumed that there's like a more special name you know like they have nuclear fuel cell right or is it nuclear fuel rod I think it's nuclear fuel cell in vanilla. So I would have thought they'd have something more like that. But anyway, you feed it with the cells, you feed it with the coolant, and then it creates this superheated plasma. And that has flow through. So you can kind of connect a bunch of reactors in line. And then on one end of the reactors, you can put your generators. 
And so these are called fusion generators. They hook up to the fusion reactors and they use that superheated plasma to create the power itself. And then they output the um, hot coolant or warm coolant, they say. So you then need to connect those generators to the coolant recycling loop, which I assume is some sort of special cooling tower or I, I can't remember if they showed us what the cooling is. It might be an assembler that cools it. It might be a special cooling tower. Um, they don't actually say in the FFF. So regardless, it's pretty cool. Uh, the new fusion generators are, it looks like three by five or three by six still kind of similar to the um, steam turbines. Uh, yeah, they're three by, I'm counting right now, three by five. Yeah, and they have tons of connections. So the, the arrangements you can make with the fusion generators and the, the hot plasma, you're going to be able to line them up in a lot of different ways. So I think unlike nuclear, I think there will be even more builds possible with fusion generators. And it's pretty easy to get larger neighbor bonuses. I also like it because you can kind of pick any number and get the neighbor bonuses pretty good. You can get two, obviously, that are just next to each other. You can get three, and each generator is going to get two neighbor bonuses. Sorry, am I saying generator? I mean reactor. You can do four reactors, and each of those reactors will... Actually, with four, I guess you have to decide whether... There's a couple ways to do it. But the way they're showing in the picture, two of them are going to have a neighbor bonus of three, and two of them are going to have a neighbor bonus of two. And I think that'll keep scaling up, and you'll be able to get larger average amounts of neighbor bonuses. And given they already start at 100 megawatts a piece, you're going to get a lot of power pretty quick. And the best thing is you don't have to worry about steam everywhere. You don't need a million turbines. You know, I don't know if you remember nuclear builds, but uh, you need a lot of steam turbines for four nuclear reactors even. Whereas now with four fusion generators, you're probably only going to need like, I don't know, I'm trying to count real quick. It looks like two, four, six, seven, twenty-eight. It looks like is the number they have, if it's symmetrical at least. So it's a lot smaller of a setup. It's way more power for the same size or way less size for the same power. And one one other thing to mention is you cannot put the plasma in pipes. So you have to connect the generators directly to the reactors. And there's no heat pipes anymore, which is kind of nice that you have to worry about. Um, you're just connecting up the, the reactors to the generators, and then you just have to make sure all the coolant connections work out at the end. So yeah, pretty cool. I'm really excited about fusion power. I think it's a good mechanic. It's just different enough from nuclear to feel fresh. It's not, it's not the same thing, but more power. You know, it's not like... A lot of the mods, which just add, you know, tier two of nuclear, which is fun, but it, it's not exciting enough to feel special. And it kind of feels like you're just doing busy work, upgrading it all to the next tier. This actually feels like a new mechanic. It feels like a new system and it's similar enough that it's familiar. You're going to understand how the neighbor bonuses work. You're going to understand how to connect the, you know, you just have to connect all the fluid connections. It's kind of like playing Legos almost. And I think there's enough connections between the reactors and the generators that it's not immediately clear to me what the optimal setup is and it might even be a situation where there's no such thing as optimal there will probably be some basic setups that are like the smallest and you know most efficient way to pack things in i'm guessing people will figure those out but it's not trivial is what i'll say to figure those out so I'm pretty excited. It's, it's a cool mechanic, and it'll be a good way to get plenty of power. I want to say towards the end of the FFF, let me see if I can find it. He mentioned how much power you can make with it, and he was like, yeah, I've got like four, you know, uh, four, what was it? They didn't say terawatts, did they? I can't even remember now. Um, All that to say, oh, here you go. Reactors for a 9 gigawatt system, and if you had legendary fusion... The picture they're showing would be 22.5 gigawatts, which is crazy. Um, and it's like not that big of a setup. It's a it's kind of a hexagon of six fusion reactors surrounded by a larger hexagon of 12 fusion reactors. So that's only 18 fusion reactors. And yeah, I'm uh, I'm pretty excited. All that to say, 
They also spoiled that, you know, since we already have the portable nuclear reactor, well, now, of course, we get a portable fusion reactor. And they kind of redesigned the old one to look like a little nuclear reactor with backpack straps, <laughs> which is hilarious. And it's called the portable fission reactor now, the nuclear one. And it has a new icon that, like I said, it looks like a nuclear reactor on backpack straps, which is really funny. And um, it's still 750 kilowatts for your backpack. And they, you know, mention again, if it's legendary, that'll be 1.875 megawatts of power. Which, and I, I feel like we've probably all, all thought about it at some point, but I had kind of forgotten that the quality system will have a really big impact on on your gear that's inside your backpack slots. I had already, th I, I remember thinking about it with exoskeletons and stuff, but even like, oh, your, your little personal laser defense, when that's legendary, it's going to be way better and you're going to be able to do way more. So being able to, you know, have more power in the same size of backpack is a good way to kind of densify. I don't know if that's a word, but condense, maybe that's what I'm looking for. A good way to condense what you're doing in your backpack. And then you also can get a bigger backpack, you know, by upgrading your power armor to a higher quality. And so, yeah, they then they changed the old model of the uh, Mr. Whatever from Back to the Future. Now that's the fusion reactor, and that's unlocked when you unlock the fusion system. And it has 2.5 megawatts at the base level and 6.25 megawatts if legendary. So yeah, pretty cool. That's uh, FFF420. I highly recommend. If you haven't already, go check it out. I've tried to summarize the major points, but I skipped over a lot. It's actually a really long FFF. They talk through... Um, kind of how they did the concept art. They talked through how they were figuring out how to make the right connections for the generators because it's not... Like, they had a bunch of different ways they could have made the system work, and they talked through, you know, how they processed through some of that, which is always... I always really enjoy that when they, when they give us new content in an FFF, but they also tell us a little bit about the process of making that content. I will now move on to FFF 421, which is called Optimizations 2.0. I just, I love optimizations. I'm not going to lie, guys. I have never, well, I won't lie. I have once built a base that was starting to dip in UPS, but uh, it's never been because it's a huge mega base. I think it was because I had some mods that were really um, UPS hungry or something. All that to say, I still love optimizations, even though I tend not to be the player who needs them because <laughs> it just it scares me when I'm like, oh, if I build too big, my base will slow down and then I'll feel horrible and have to quit. Um, for whatever reason, UPS issues, I think, bu bug me more than they do the average player. Like if my game was running at 58 FPS, it would feel horrible to me, even though it, it might not even be noticeable. The thing I do notice are lag spikes. If there's a, a little spike every second or something, that actually really bothers me and makes a game almost unplayable to me. Um, but if it was a smooth 58 FPS, I probably wouldn't actually care that much. All that to say, I love that they're still doing optimizations, and it sounds like they did hit the UPS ceiling a bit more with Space Age because of how much bigger you can build, because of what legendary modules and buildings and such can do for you, you end up building much larger bases. So I do think some of these were necessary. I think some uh, some of the optimizations are maybe not necessary, but still very um, appreciated. So they talk about RoboPort optimization, which is funny because they've already optimized RoboPorts, but they did it even more. You know, they changed it. Uh, they changed the logic so that RoboPorts don't actually have an active state in terms of what the game needs to update. And they they wait to update anything until they're actually needed. And I don't, you know, as always, I don't know exactly how it works on the in the on the back end. But essentially, they just are off internally until they need to do something. And it says here. The end result just worked. The time spent on RoboPorts in our recent playtesting save file dropped from an average of 1 millisecond to 0 0.025 milliseconds, which is an absurd savings. I, let me do the math real quick. What is that? 40 times less? Like 1 40th of the computation power? That's, that's massive. I mean, it basically turns it to zero. 
you know, 0 0.025 milliseconds is, and this is obviously on a huge base. If it was taking one millisecond, um, it was a massive base and 0 0.025 milliseconds is, you know, nothing. You, if you're saying at 60 FPS, you get 16.6 milliseconds to play around with. So that's one, uh, whatever 16 times 40 is. It's like one six hundredth of the computation power that you have. Anyway, the next thing they talk about is radars and optimizing how radars work. And if you build a bunch of radars that are overlapping previously, they were just kind of wasting that overlap space. So instead, they changed it to a style where they kind of register which chunks are supposed to stay revealed. And then if you know, a radar reveals a new chunk, then it um, kind of gives it a counter. So each chunk is kind of incrementing or decrementing that counter each tick. And if it's, you know, because when the radar explores a new chunk, it stays revealed for so many ticks. And so all that to say, it's some system that just makes things a lot better and it loops through all the chunks every so often and it works how much faster? What did they say? Um... It improved the overall game performance by 3.6%. Given it wasn't even meant to have a measurable impact, if anything, I expected adding radar coverage to RoboPorts would make it worse, a 3.6 overall improvement was great. Oh yeah, and the radar, now RoboPorts have radar coverage. I forgot to mention that. That's an important, <laughs> an important change. And so somehow with all of these changes combined, even with making RoboPorts capable of having a little bit of radar coverage, it actually still updates a lot faster on the radar end and on the RoboPort end. So, as always, the, the optimizations are just, are just incredible. Uh, Wuba has no end in sight to how they can optimize things. I, I do feel like someday we're going to be able to play Space Age on a potato. Like, someone's going to do it. They're going to, you know, get a bunch of potatoes in their gar garage. We've already done Doom on a potato. I'm guessing we're going to do Factorio on potatoes. <laughs> anyway, uh, they, a couple other small features they mentioned. Um, there's a lamp always on feature now. So if you want your lamps to, to be on during the day because you're doing something with the colors and you didn't want to have to hook them up to the network, then you can just set them to always on. And you can also set the color without it being connected to a circuit network. Now, I don't remember if that was already spoiled or if that was spoiled in this one. But all that to say, now you can basically use lamps to make art or you can use lamps to, you know, make shapes. I don't I don't know. I'm not a big user of lamps other than to keep my base lit. Um, I know some people like to make like little readouts that turn red and, you know, you've got 10 lamps. And if something only has 50 percent full, only five of the lamps are on and they're yellow, and then if it's all full, they're all green. That I know a lot of people like doing that, and that's really cool. I personally don't do that, so to me, lamp stuff isn't a huge deal. I mainly just make lamps so that things aren't dark when I look at map view. By the way, I'm curious, now that I'm thinking about map view, I'm curious if they have a night vision for map view because we're going to use it so much more when going into map view for the other planets. Because if they don't, we are pretty much going to need lamps everywhere to be able to do stuff on the other planets while we're sitting on Navis. Uh, then they talk about multi-threading and how how do you multi-thread belt reading and control behaviors. So right now, people started to use a lot of belt readers because they're so easy now. If you don't remember, they added a functionality for whole belt reading, which reads a whole section of belt, you know, between splitters or, or breaks in the belt. And so now people are using them all over the place because they're so easy to use and the, the functionality of a whole belt reader is so much greater. And what did he say? There were also, <laughs> yeah, there were also active provider chests that turned it into a logistics robot hell with more than 10K logistics robots being in the air at all times. Prusa was the primary saboteur of our playtesting. So optimizing the code for logistics robots for, was for someone else, but belt reader and control behaviors are for me to handle. And the person writing this is Boskid. And so he said, belt reader under the hood is really simple. Every tick it has to see what items are on the belt and how many of them are in each stack on the belt to count the total. 
and optimizing it went through a couple iterations kind of went through a few different things and the turning point was realizing a simple fact that a belt reader is mostly a read operation it just reads a lot of data from memory and at the end produces a single frame of signals to be sent to a circuit network this structure means I should be able to do multi-threading on it. Multiple belt readers computed at the same time do not interfere with each other as they only read belt contents and their output is not used by other belt readers. Similar structure was easy to see in other places like RoboPorts reading logistics network content, arithmetic combinators, selector combinators, and decider combinators. Yada, yada, yada. It was pretty easy to make multi-threaded. And with all those changes done, our playtesting save file could run about 9.5% faster. A synthetic save file with 77,000 combinators interconnected with 6,000 circuit networks I was using during development was running 15 times faster while keeping a consistent 100% CPU usage. A benchmark time went from 131 seconds to about 8.2 seconds. So that's crazy. I mean, you know, it just so many improvements. I've, I've always felt a little scared of the circuit network. Like if I'm copy, copying and pasting something that uses complicated circuits for every single build, you know, in this example, it's usually train stops where I'm scared to put complicated circuitry. I think it's pretty clear that they've made circuits even more efficient. They're not scary anymore. You can use basically as many of them as you want. And you're not going to have any problems. Apparently, there was a failed attempt at multi-threading the electric network to try to make it more efficient. And they couldn't quite figure out... Um, how to multi-thread them in a way that was actually more efficient. Like they did end up multi-threading them, but here it said, our playtesting save file having at least four large electric networks, which were completely independent since they're on different planets. However, the electric network update time remained the same while the CPU usage went up. So they, they tried to figure out like, can we make it so that when you have independent networks, they can be calculated on different, you know, CPU cores and it just didn't work out. So unfortunately, not every idea works, but I'm I like that they shared with us how they failed. You know, it's like there are there are times um, there are times you try things and they don't work out. And that's part of what development looks like. Um, they also had complications with the electric network because of things like power switches or buildings being able to have one foot in network A and another foot in network B. And what happened, which network is powering it? I actually don't even to be certainly honest, perfectly honest, I don't know how that works right now. Like if I have network A, which is providing 150 kilowatts, and network B, which is providing 10 billion gigawatts, and I have an assembler that needs 300 kilowatts that is spanning both of those power networks, what happens? I don't even know what happens right now. Does it split it 50-50? Does it, is it whichever one was built first? Is it just some weird archaic you know, random code that decides which one powers it. Does it, I, I literally don't even know. Um, so all that to say, uh, they couldn't figure out how to make it more efficient, but it also sounds like it's not the biggest of issues in the first place. You know, it sounded like a uh, playtesting save file had a 0.5 millisecond update, which is pretty big, but it's not, you know, the biggest of big when it comes to that being a huge save file. And then they talk about worker robots, which again, we've already had an update on worker robots and how they're um, assigned to their tasks. They already optimized that and shared how they did that. And now there's the issue of overpopulated logistics robots um, and what happens when robots are homeless like they had some some error someone had removed a cable from a system and so more robots kept getting sent to the fulgora base and they ended up with 10,000 homeless robots even though every single robo port was full <laughs> um so apparently the worker robot update was too simplistic all the robots are iterated every tick and their update logic is executed but most of the time their their logic is really simple because it's just keep moving towards the target you're already moving to or all you're doing is waiting for a charging turn you know they wait their turn to charge and a lot of if you've got thousands of robots charging on one robo port 
most of them are doing the same thing for a very long time, which is just waiting, right? So the idea that they got was to fake smooth movement of something while actually only updating once in a while. And they linked to a couple other FFFs where they used this trick. And so they decided to try to use that same trick on worker robots. So essentially, they are all updating the graphics consistently so it looks like it's moving smoothly but they show a gif of like the real robot and it's actually this very laggy like it's only updated three times a second type of thing which is 1 20th of the updates that it had before now the question i have is what happens when you have really fast robots? I'm thinking in particular modded robots, like when you get the tier four Bob's bots and you've upgraded worker robot speed a hundred times, they're insanely fast. You know, we're talking like they can move 10 tiles in just a few ticks. I'm wondering how exactly that works because if they're only updating once every 20 ticks now, is that gonna be the minimum travel time for a robot from one location to another? And if it is, that could significantly reduce kind of the maximum possible robot speed. Because like if you had a chest next to another chest and bots are really fast, I think theoretically they could have picked up something on one tick, dropped it off on the next tick, picked it up again on the next tick, dropped it off again on the next tick. And they're basically a two tick cycle for a bot to go from one chest to another that's adjacent to it. And I'm curious if it can still do a one or two tick cycle because of the, you know, 20 ticks of movement without update thing. And as far as I could tell, it wasn't totally clear in the FFF whether that would ruin that possibility or, or that possibility is still there. However, the results of the save performance was huge for this save because this one had a ton of robots. But uh, the overall save performance in this one was 15%, which again is such a, that's a massive number. I mean, in development, if you get a, a performance I improvement of half a percent or 1% or 2%, that feels pretty significant, you know, because those all start to add up when you do a bunch of those couple percent improvements. So a single improvement being a 15% performance boost is massive. Even just in this update alone for four, you know, FFF 421, all of these put together probably result in, you know, depending on how many bots you have or how many circuit networks you have and whatnot, how many radars and robo ports you have. It seems like the performance could increase by like over 50% with all of these changes put together, which is just awesome. You know, that means if you previously had a base that would have gone down to 40 updates per second, that is now a base that would never drop below 60. And if you think about it that way, that's pretty impressive because a base that goes down to 40 UPS is getting pretty chonky, right? And now that base would never even drop below 60. So I do think it's going to be a bit more of a challenge to uh, hit the UPS ceiling in Space Age. And I'm pretty excited about that. Okay, I'm moving on. 422. Now this one's a really exciting one for those who like combat. The title of Factorio Friday Facts 422 is Tesla Turret. You heard me right. They are adding a lightning lightning turret, the Tesla turret itself. Um, it's a really cool looking looking thing. It's got like a, it looks a little bit like the beacon. Um, it's kind of a circular base. And then it kind of has like a turret spire that comes up in the middle. And there's like electricity moving all around it. And there's a little pop up um kind of like sphere it almost looks like a little eyeball and then it shoots out this particle beam that has electricity all around it and when the particle beam hits a biter it creates a chain lightning that can jump to secondary targets 10 times and they all take the full damage so this thing is nuts in how much damage it does it wipes out an entire wave of small and medium biters basically in one shot so that's really cool. It is a much larger turret. Uh, rather than being a two by two footprint, it's a four by four footprint. So it's the size of basically four turrets. Um, and it uses a lot of power, they mention, and the passive power draw is very large. And they decided to reduce the laser turrets passive power draw. So laser turrets now are far more of a, they're only consuming a lot of power when they're shooting. And the Tesla turrets are a much larger kind of constant cost 
So you're probably going to want just a few of them in key locations that get attacked a lot, because if you were to just build a whole wall of Tesla turrets, you'd need an absurd amount of power to power those, which I'm sure many of us will do because it sounds like fusion power is great, but it's not just free to build a wall of Tesla turrets in the sense that they're going to cost you a lot of power. And it also has another effect, which is a little bit of a stun. What it does is it stuns the biter for a few ticks and it pushes it backwards. Um, it actually mentioned at first they only had the stun, but it didn't quite look very effective. It didn't look like it did very much. So they changed it so that it, it moves the biter back a little bit. It's not a ton. It's almost not noticeable, but it's just enough that it kind of makes them look like they got, you know, ah, taken aback by the by the lightning in my face. So that's pretty cool. Um, they mention also that the higher qualities of the turret have a higher chance to get an extra fork and so the you know i already mentioned that it forks to 10 it bounces to 10 enemies and those of you that have played a lot of different games especially games with like spells and stuff know a lot about how chain lightning can work in games and normal chain lightning just bounces from one enemy to the next right it finds an enemy that's nearby bounces to that one then that finds an enemy and there's usually some limit to the number of bounces and in this case the limit is 10 but it there's also a capability that each jump can fork so it will actually jump to two targets at once and what they didn't totally say is whether those forks keep jumping um themselves or if a fork is just basically one additional hit and then that fork is dead after that hit i'm not totally sure it's i'm guessing the fork is dead after it forks but all that to say they say there's a base chance of five percent for a fork to happen which would actually mean you'd hit 10 enemies plus five enemies so you'd hit about 15 enemies per shot on average Okay, no, that's not how 5% works. I'm thinking 50%. My bad. You would hit 10.5 enemies <laughs> per shot. And then a legendary Tesla turret, the fork chance jumps up to 30%. So you'll see a lot more forks. I guess that would be an average of about three forks per shot. And I'm guessing, like I said, I think those forks then don't keep jumping. But it'd be pretty cool if they did. Uh, anyway, they also added a personal lightning gun or Tesla gun. So you uh, have your own personal version and it also does the stunning thing. So it's a bit more of a crowd control weapon and it can jump more times and a higher forking chance is what they say. So it looks like a pretty good weapon to make sure they don't eat your face off when they're chasing you. Um, Cause if you're, it doesn't do as much damage as just shooting them with rockets, but the extra bounces make it so that it's kind of stunning and pushing back a lot of enemies at the same time. All that to say, Tesla turrets are pretty sweet. Go check out the FFF to see the art. Uh, they kind of talk through their different iterations of the art. At first, it looked a little bit too much like the beacons, and so they changed it to feel a bit more like the laser turret, kind of almost mixed with a beacon. And I still feel personally like it looks a bit too much like a beacon. I think the round base, it's a perfectly circular base. I don't know if I love that. I kind of wish the base was maybe even like octagonal or something because I think the circularness makes it look very beacon-esque. Um, yeah, anyway, they then, the, it's that's only half the FFF, maybe not even half. The, the other half, they get into some very intricate detail on the graphics of the beam and the electricity and how did they make the little lightning you know shoot offs that look cool and how did they make it so that they don't look repetitive and how did they make it so that they look directional and not just kind of like you can't tell which way the lightning's going and all that it's a really cool read i think trying to describe it in a podcast would be pretty boring for most of you and also hard to describe because the gifs help you understand what's going on quite a bit so i suggest if you're interested in, in the graphics stuff go give it a read it's pretty cool and uh they they do a good job of describing kind of how they did each step so yeah that's uh that's all the ffs um some pretty cool news i think the fusion reactors for me are the coolest i like the tesla turrets i'm excited to use them i think i'm mainly excited just because they look cool 
like watching the Tesla turrets shoot enemies and watching the chain the chain lightning bouncing along the enemies. I just think that's really sweet. So I'm excited because the wave defense feeling of Factorio, I think is only gonna get cooler. Right now, wave defense looks a lot like, oh, my flamethrowers are tossing a bunch of flames. So there's always like the battlefield is on fire and then lasers are just melting anything that gets a little too close. That's pretty much all we see right now. But now we're going to have rocket turrets and Tesla coils added into the mix. And so there's just there's going to be a lot more going on when there's waves of biters and you have more choices, right? Before there wasn't a ton of choice for like how you would. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? The composition of your defenses. I mean, yes, you could use mines or you could use gun turrets. Gun turrets with uranium ammo were good for certain things, but more or less people would just use flamethrowers and lasers, right? That like that was how most people did their defenses. And I think now with the addition of rocket turrets and Tesla turrets, there's a little bit more of a sense of I can do this different ways and they could all work pretty well rather than feeling like, I mean, I could do it this other way, but I kind of just need to do flamethrowers and lasers. Now it does feel like, oh, I could use a bunch of Tesla turrets and not use flamethrowers at all because the Tesla turrets are going to be good at crowd control. Or I could use rocket turrets to deal with the smaller masses of enemies. And then I can use gun turrets with legendary, you know, uranium ammo to, to kill the high priority enemies. Because remember, we have target priority now. So we can tell our gun turrets with legendary uranium ammo to only shoot big biters and higher. And then they won't waste their time shooting the little biters. And that will make them much more efficient at wearing down the big targets. So there's a lot more options now for, for how we defend our bases. And I think that's cool because then it will feel a bit more like my play style is different than your play style. And we both found a way that works. So I like that. I think that's pretty cool. Um, and what else? Oh yeah, no, someone on Twitch just point, uh, there's a graphic and the forks do look like they jump. Um, they show a graphic at the end of the FFF. It's hard to watch. I almost need to slow down the GIF, but it does look like when it forks, the forked bolt also does its own jumping. So that is different than what I imagined it would be. That's really cool. Yeah. I just saw a fork jump like twice or at least once. It's kind of hard because they only fork if there's enemies nearby and in the GIF, sometimes there's not enough enemies for that to happen. So it's hard to tell exactly what the mechanics are under the hood, but it does look like the forks can jump. Sweet. Oh, that's really cool. Okay, well, those are all the FFFs for today. I'm, as always, just massively excited for Space Age. I can't believe that there's still more. Like, how many weeks we have 70 days or whatever so there's still like 10 or 11 or 12 more fffs so there's still even more content i mean we already know there's gonna be new enemies we already know there's a whole nother planet they haven't spoiled so those are some things we know they haven't spoiled but that's i mean there's probably a lot of little things that they've teased that they'll spoil that they haven't spoiled yet but at least in on the top of my mind most of it is the enemies and the fifth planet and that's really only two or three, maybe four, depending on how they do the enemies, FFFs. It's just crazy to me how much we've already gotten. And I just continue to say Space Age is bigger than an expansion. It's bigger than a sequel. Like the, the stuff they're adding is way bigger than Vanilla Factorio is altogether. It, it's more than a new game. It's it's an amazing experience. So I cannot wait for Space Age. I know most of you feel the same way. Um, yeah, that's all I got uh, for today's FFFs. I do have one other little topic I want to touch on and then we'll wrap up the podcast. So I'll start by saying this podcast is semi-separate from my content creation as Crydax. Most of you probably know both, right? A lot of you listen to this podcast because you know me from my factorial videos or Twitch streaming or whatnot. And a lot of you are on the Discord. Um, you know, this disc or this podcast shares the Discord and the Patreon, you know, with my other content creation. It's not like I have a separate Discord or a separate you know, channel 
on the dis I do have a separate channel on the Discord to talk about the podcast, but I don't have a separate Discord and I don't have a separate Patreon. And so a lot of you are kind of in both worlds. And for those of you that are, there's a pretty exciting announcement for me that I am moving to full time content creation. I'm making the push to actually kind of turn it into my quote unquote real job. And that's what I'm going to be doing with my time. And I'm really excited about that. It's going to look like a lot more streams and a lot more consistent streams and more YouTube content that's released that's separate from what I recorded in the streams. So if I have a Factorio series that's going to YouTube, it won't be from me streaming Factorio. My streams will be something else. So there's going to be a lot more total content going to the various channels. And if you're interested in that, you can head over to the YouTube or the the Twitch or the YouTube uh, the YouTube live because I'll be, you know, streaming to both. And I also would ask if you are interested in supporting that, that you would consider supporting on Patreon, because obviously in a push to full time content creation, I'm looking to be able to make enough of a living off that so that it works. Um, I don't have any expectations that any of you support me financially. You are the one who knows what to do with your money and you need to decide what what is worth your money. And so I trust you guys to to make the right decisions with your money, but I do ask you to consider supporting on Patreon. The The bottom tier is only $2, and that's quite a few months before that even adds up to one burrito's worth of, uh, of money. So, you know, if I'm worth one burrito every few months to you, with all the content you know that I push out, then consider it. I'm not saying you need to feel like you need to do it. If if you just don't want to or you don't, you know, it to some level, I also feel the the sense of there's so many content creators I watch. If I were to support all of them on Patreon at $2 a month, that would be way more money than I can spend. So don't feel any pressure, um, but do consider it. And with that, I think I'm going to wrap up uh, episode 16 of The Factory Must Grow. We've got some exciting guests lined up. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when each guest is airing yet, so I don't want to uh, spoil it too soon. Um, The next podcast will be on... I'm looking at my calendar here. August 18th. Uh, Remember, we've switched now to the first and third Sunday of the month. That's going to continue. The reason this one's um, on Saturday is because of Gen Con. I'm going to Gen Con tomorrow, so I'm pretty excited about that. And as always, if you have any ideas for topics, ideas for guests, please head over to the Crydania Discord and let me know there if you'd like to just chat with me. Discord's a great place for that. I'll put links to all those in the description As always, thank you guys for listening. We'll see you in two weeks. And always remember, the factory must grow. All right. Oh, man, I'm so excited for Space Age. After talking about all that, I'm just like, give me this game already. Like, I love everything about it. I need this game. Oh, man. Oh, it's so cool. Yeah, like you said, Dave, there's the cooling tower. I meant to mention that and then I got distracted with something. <laughs> I I love the, the placeholder art. It's like a little winky face with question marks. So this is confusing to me. Isn't that hot coolant that's going into the the input oh oh sorry that's an underground going left never mind um yeah the other thing i'm curious about is what are the the amount oh never mind it doesn't matter they have a new fluid system (laughs) i was about to say what are the amounts of the coolants are we going to need like multiple pipes because it's going to be too much cool too much coolant per second um Oh, you know what, Dave? I think you're right. I think that is pasted over. I don't know. I guess it could just be pasted over the picture. It does look kind of pasted over because then they erased the pasted over part to show the fluid connections. So I think given that, I think you're right. In fact, let's look at the other one and see if it looks different. Um, It does look like it's the same sprite that's pasted over both because those are the same they have the same cutouts 
But they also have their connections in the same spots, so why do the same work twice, to be fair? You can see it in the bottom left corner, it's pasted. The smileys are different. Um, wow. Yeah, that, uh, I was looking at the edges. It's like they pasted the same uh, background, but then they drew different question marks and smileys on it. Um, okay, so wait, what was it? Um, who said in the bottom left? What do we see in the bottom left? Bottom left corner. I don't see anything. Am I blind? Crydax blind? We need a Crydax blind emote on Twitch, that's for sure. Uh, that is most certainly necessary. Someone come up with a Crydax blind emote and I'll put it on Twitch. If somebody makes one and it's reasonably good, doesn't have to be perfect, but good enough, I will I will happily put it on Twitch. I need more emotes anyway. Now that I'm going full time, you know, I got to have I got to have great emotes. I like the ones I already have, but I need more. Um Anyway, yeah, I think that's pretty much it for this stream. Uh there's a decent chance I actually stream more today. I don't know what I'm going to stream, but uh, definitely like I'm planning on streaming later today. So you can expect that and I will see you all next time. Yeah, double eye patch wear. Exactly. Yeah, that's accurate. Stream brain. It's real. It is real. Define later. Uh, that's a good question. Couple hours. So something like that. One one to four hours, I guess. I'll say to be vague. <laughs> You're working later today. Uh, that's the worst. I don't know. Maybe it's not. Maybe you like your work, but either way. There's always some amount of work that's not fun, even if you like your work, so. All right. As always, if you have more thoughts on whatever we talked about in this stream, head over to the Discord, hit me up, and I will see you guys next time. Yeah, Demon, that makes sense. You accidentally made yourself important. That's the worst. Bye, Alor. Bye, Demon. Bye, Dave.